through amplifying the voices and vision of innovative educational leaders, practitioners, and learners from South Africa. Ifikile imini enkulu. Welcome to JGF Amplified, amplifying the voices and the visions of uh, teachers and learners in South Africa. I am Matabo Tladi, and today Andi Ambi Ndota, as you would have tuned into our episode last week, you know that we are knee deep in the candidate fellows perspective we started season two with the season with a with a theme rather called leading today for tomorrow a three-part series and now we are in our next series called the cf perspective the candidate fellows perspective and the avidota jangbandi chilo ke we have mpila ho newly qualified teacher you were on that stage in Pilanini. <laughs> Nini, July. Yes, it was July. This is what Chica is into on that <laughs> stage with your guys' certificates in hand. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Your commitment has paid off from PGCE. Now you are a newly qualified teacher and you are in a classroom. First of all, who is Mpila? Where is she from? Um, I'm from Oliver and Hortbush. I'm a teacher um, and I'm so passionate about touching lives and making sure that my babies, mm. my learners, um, get the best out of this life. Yeah. Mm. So, Mpila, growing up, uh, did you grow up at Oliver? Uh, how was your childhood and what were your aspirations growing up? Um, actually, I didn't grow up in Oliven. Okay. I grew up in Limpopo. Mm. I was raised by my grandmother. And I didn't have the most pleasing childhood. Mm. Um, I was that child who needed a holding hand and somebody who's going to be there for me and motivate me because, you know, puberty and teenagehood can be rough sometimes. Yeah. So my mother was always away and I had my grandmother and she didn't know how to help me when and how to ask me those pressing questions that you should or one should ask a teenager. And when I grew up, when I got, when I got to university, I got to learn that there is a lot that I missed or there is a lot that I didn't get as a child. So mm. I just wanted to impact lives yeah. because my life was not impacted in a way that could make me the most amazing person or the happiest child. So I took upon myself to study towards uh, a degree that will help me impact lives. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I just knew then that I want to impact lives. So when did you get to a point where you're like, you know what, I want to impact lives, right? Because you say that your background wasn't necessarily pleasing. So what I assume is that going to university, you needed to be motivated to say, I'm mm -hmm. going to university. What motivated you uh, to take the leap from matric to university? Um, I was a very vibrant learner. Mm. I was a very vibrant child and a dreamer. I wanted to see myself being somebody important in life. Mm. And uh, when I got to university, I was studying performing arts. And that is then that I got to find myself that no I'm not a competitive person and I don't want the spotlight mm. I just want to touch lives then I changed to studying language English second language I think acquisition yeah second language acquisition how the brain um, acquires a second language what what theories goes into or go into learning a second language and I found myself I could relate to the theories that you need to be exposed to a certain language at a young age to learn it proficiently, mm. to be able to be proficient in it so that you can, you know, excel. For example, for in, if, uh, in English, you have to learn English to excel in all the subjects. And I was that learner who was not good in English. So everything was so relatable and it was interesting. So then I decided to be a second language teacher. So essentially, Mpila, you studied with the sole intention 
of going back to your community and affecting change? Because many of us could study, <coughs> let's say, performing arts. More generations. Yes. I want to be this person, that person. But you found something that wasn't necessarily just relatable to you, but mm. also to the context that you come from. Definitely. So now you apply to get into JGF. How did you hear about JGF? Um, <laughs> like any South African student, I was looking for, um, I was looking for funding. Mm. And then when I got to like search and do my research, I was just on Google, like PGCE funding. And then I found Funza Lushaka, obviously, mm. and it's first, and I found JGF. Then I perused through the website and it matched. Mm. It was my perfect match because already I had a plan of how I'm going to like impact lives through education. I had my own school, my own um, business proposal of the, sc- the kind of school I want to open. So it was something that was like sort of magical at that point because I was like, this is me. They want me. So I applied. Yeah, yeah, but, but I've not this before. Yeah, these people want me. Yeah. So I applied. And yeah. But, yeah, then, I but I want to unpack this thing because you say that you grew up in such a way that you didn't have a hand that held you mm. um, at a fundamental stage of your life. But the time now you apply go JGF, you're a person who has a vision. Mm. What happened in between you applying for JGF, well, in between you being a teen who didn't necessarily have support, to you applying to JGF with an entire business plan? Mm. What transformation happened in between for you to you know, get that self-motivation and do what needs to be done um, in mapping out your journey to impact. Okay. Um, during, can I highlight the, the, the selection camp? Of course. Um, during the selection camp, I could tell that I have everything figured out. I just wanted somebody to find me, mm. um, people of my caliber to find me and motivate me and tell me that, actually, this is doable, this is important, this is what we need because a lot of people don't want to venture into into education yes. at all because of the lack of support we have as teachers and as students, you know. Then I got to meet JGF or to get aligned with JGF and everything was just, everything fell into place. Like everything, all puzzles, all the puzzles were fitting perfectly and during the selection camp, all the questions were like sort of like easy for me mm. because I had it in me already. Mm. I already had the answers. I didn't have to fabricate fabricate any information. I didn't have to lie. Mm. You didn't for, have to play up anything. Mm, you just so had to be yourself. I, 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 I like it was so easy for me. But remember about the learner that I was. Yeah, I said something about a learner who couldn't utter a sentence in English to save her life. And now she's writing a business plan. Now she's writing a business plan. I'm just a kid from Limpopo meeting those awesome people from Verts from UJ. I thought I, I won't make it because I was not competent. Yeah. My, my my communicative competency was like low Yeah. in all the groups I found myself. But because I had a vision, I had a voice, finally somebody could relate to what I was trying to bring forth. Let's unpack this vision, Mpela, because mm. you say that uh, you were looking for a scholarship that matched your caliber. Mm. Invite us to this <laughs> caliber okay? mm. and tell us what it is that you envisioned for yourself as a practitioner within the education space. Mm. Apparently, I didn't know that the language of teaching and learning in South African schools is English. Remember, I went to a primary school in Limbobo and everything was done in my home language. Mm. I got to high school, the same thing happened. Mm. When I got to university during presentations, it was very difficult. Then I said to myself, I am going to be there for all the kids that do not get the support. I will try by all means. I'll have my own school where maybe I will adopt um, certain learners from disadvantaged areas to like give back to community. That was my plan. I was like, okay, I'm going to have a private school, obviously. And then 
I will maybe invite um, learners who are bright or learners who are struggling, maybe 10 learners from a certain um, primary school in my area or in my village. Mm. And then so that I can give back to the community. Because I knew I could feel the frustration of not knowing how to respond to questions in class mm. or during exams because you are taught in this language and you have to respond in English and it gets very difficult and you get to, you you are limited. Your imagination is limited because you can't think, you cannot independently think in this language, you know. Mm. And I think it's the, very, it's the experience of each and every um, South African learner that goes to a public school. It happens a lot, mm. you know. So I thought it was not a thing. I thought I was going to start my own school that um, uses English as a language of learning and teaching. Whereas... There are theories. This is something that should have happened or should be happening. I am so excited speaking to you because where our selection is concerned, you are essentially really the candidate that we go for and look for, right? Someone mm -hmm. who is obsessed with a problem. Um, and you found the problem and you found means to address it. And what I also love about your experience, uh, experience in Bile is that it wasn't a thing that you personalized. Mm. You weren't the issue. There is a bigger systemic issue. There are theories around it. Mm. There are responses to the issue and you immersed yourself in the theory uh, uh within your studies. Mm. Now tell us about your experience through selection. You told us, easy peasy. Mm. They are looking for Mimos. <laughs> These are my people. Mm. They are my caliber. After the, the selection camp, what was your thoughts when you were waiting for the response from JGF? It was the most challenging, challenging time of my life. I think Kala knew me before. Um, we could meet in person because I was always messaging her. I was one, I was They're that person. Like, hey, <laughs> people who work in selection at JGF, and Pila is one of those people <laughs> who use our personal phone numbers as WhatsApp lines. Pila, you people. I was actually sending her um, uh, like um, emails almost every week. Uh -huh. I was like, when okay, are we going to get the WhatsApp line? Get yeah. Emails. I was okay, sending okay. emails. And also I decided to make a very... Um, Challenging um, decision, right? I sure. had to move from University of Limpopo because I'm surrounded by people who speak the same language with me mm -hmm. or we share the same language. Then I had to move to UJ or Verge. The, those are the universities I applied to for my PGC because I wanted to improve my English. Remember, mm -hmm. I was doing damage control, you know, and then I said to myself, I'm going to be a teacher. I'll have to use this language. So let me be strategic about this. But to an entrepreneurial mindset, <laughs> it is a problem. Mm. Right. So for me to leave this problem mm. to get to my desired point, these are the steps and sacrifices that I need to make. And one sacrifice that you made is to leave your space of comfort, mm. your space of safety, a place you call home. I can identify with that mm. and move to a place of the unknown. How was that transition for you? It was very difficult. I made the move because I moved from one province to another in pursuit of a language. Yo! In pursuit I... of a language. Nothing else. Just to be competent in this <laughs> language. I'm done. I'm done. Write a book. Write a book. Because <laughs> I knew that I have to surround myself with people mm. who will help me practice this language. I didn't have the luxury of going to a private school. I didn't have the luxury of using English outside the school premises, sometimes even in class. We're taught in Watching TV language. was not enough. It was not enough because I knew the language. Remember, I can understand when a person talks to me. That's how we learn other languages, you know. Mm. But independently constructing sentences was something foreign yeah. for me. You know, I have to think and you start panicking. They, they're they going to laugh at me because I'm going to make mistakes, you know. Yeah. And then you meet these amazing people who can think in this language, who can reason in this language, and you can't, mm. you mm. know. So I had to make that conscious conscious decision to leave Limpopo and come to Gauteng. Okay. What were your first impressions about this university life and one that operates with English being the medium of instruction? Um, let's just say I was fighting a lot with my um, PO because okay. I, couldn't, I couldn't keep up. I don't want to lie. 
I was struggling a lot. So when you say lot. fighting with your PO, what weren't you coping with in particular? I was not coping with my academic work and mm. she was trying to like uh, motivate me. You have to do this, you have to do that. I had a lot of stress. You know, I could not keep up with the standard of the university. I was from University of Limpopo, obviously, yeah. to University of Johannesburg. So the standard is a very... It's a little bit higher, yes. you know, and the questions are just way too difficult. Everything is just so amazing. It's all at the same time. Like everything was just coming at me all at the same time. And I have to like get better marks because I'm in a scholarship, you know, mm -hmm. I'm afraid that if I lose this, you know, I won't get to like my voice, my vision will never get to like spread across this country. So I was struggling with content, obviously, mm -hmm. with the form of communication, you know, now I was taught by like people of like the lecturers were not of my race, you know. Yes. And the way they speak, obviously, they are eloquent, you know. And I would like, like, please, can you be a little bit clear? Because now you are twanging. I cannot hear you. And oh, this is a higher oh, institution. Yes, yes, yes. And this is a higher institution, you know. And you cannot <laughs> tell someone that, ma'am. <laughs> Come down to my level, please, girl. You cannot do that, you know. <laughs> but I think after April, you know, after writing so many reflections and meeting up with people who are competent in this language. You know, you get to practice, you know, you get to do a lot of presentations and the teaching practice was also like a plus because I got to practice my language skills. It was, yeah, it yeah. was difficult because sometimes I could miss meetings with my PO because I'm so tired, I'm so stressed, you know, I don't know. I I think um, I I am not coping with yeah. everything, you know. So it was just a very, it was a difficult time for me. So as the problem solver that you are, mm. you ascertain that even in the class, in the in the lecture room now, mm. that you are not keeping up at the rate that you need to? Plus it was online. Plus it was on those rectangles. Mm. Zoom and Microsoft, what, what? What were the interventions then that you created for yourself? What opportunities did you seize from JGF? Um, what opportunities did you seize from the University of Johannesburg and anywhere else for that matter to help you be where you are today, where you are an educator of 70 plus students in, in, one, Olive, in one, one, class. one class in Olive N. Um, I had a meeting with Siwa. She was my PO, and Usiwa betuna ni PO of the year. <laughs> yes, we PO of the year because we had Usiwa Nisi. He was like my PO Siwa, mm -hmm. and now you are also shout out to you, Siwa Piwa. Yeah, she was very very helpful because she gave me a strategy that I could follow, and then she taught me to plan ahead and mm -hmm. do my work beforehand and not wait for the very last minute. You know. Mm -hmm. And that really did help me a lot. And then we did try and find myself a tutor. Yes. And then I was like, let's just reserve the services for the final examination. And then throughout the year, I did a lot of reflections and she would motivate me. Like she, we would meet like every two weeks or every week. She mm. was that committed and she was forever ready to hear whatever I had to say. So she would encourage me that, you know what, forget about where you come from, your background, your university, your lack of um, good communication skills do not define you. What defines you is the vision you have and where you are going now and where you are now. Like, look at yourself. You are a JGF candidate. That says a lot about you. Mm. So just practice. Allow yourself to learn at a pay pace that you are comfortable in and just do the best you can. And those interventions then led to your peak in graduating. Ukredil, mm. NQT, and now, eh? Level seven. Level seven. On <laughs> level seven, mm. and now you have young minds looking at you, saying, "Ma'am," saying, "Teacher," mm. saying, "Mistress," a Olive. Mm. Take us to the moment where you realize, you know what, I'm graduating. 
Mm. How did that feel? Um, it was a very emotional period in my life. Mm. I was so sad um, because all the hassle that I had to go through, mm. you know, it was a very emotional journey for me, you know, and then seeing that now I'm a qualified teacher, now I have kids in my hands, mm. now I have those innocent souls that I need to save, it was very scary. I was scared. I was like, can I do, can I really do this, you mm. know? Um, at some point, I just decided, you know what, I can only do my best and I am definitely going to do my best. Yeah. And I think I am. First day of school, Kenamu classing, mm. how many learners are in your class? Um, <clears throat> actually, I was expecting this because mm. you remember, this is the school I did my pregs in last year. Oh, right. I was then um, seen or selected or like... Um, they got to know me through my pregs because yes. I was very active. So I was familiar. very active. How were you active? You know, I was that <laughs> student teacher. Ma'am, can I help you? Can I have one more yes. class? Can I do this? How do we do that? I was very coachable and I was very determined to be part of the school because this is one of the best schools in the environment or in the area in Olive and Hotbush, you know. Why did you choose that school? Um, because it's the best in Oliven, yes, you know, and you wanted to go back to your community. I also wanted to go back to my community. Yes, and the school leader is very determined, and you know, I just wanted to be part of her team because I could see her vision. Yeah, mm -hmm. all right. And yes. now, your classroom now in the pandemic. when I walked into the classroom, then you walked into the classroom that now I am responsible for that yeah. now I have to account for. <laughs> it was. I was scared. I don't want to lie. I was scared because there were like 72 learners staring at me, mm. waiting for me to open my mouth. Like 72. Mm. I could I could barely move. Like you just get into the class and stand at the fourth because there's no space to even reach the back, um, the back of the classroom. You get into that classroom, you, you're, you're teaching English first ad additional language. Mm -hmm. From that first class, what were you left with? What did you realize after your first class? Um, you know, as a new teacher, when you walk into a classroom, you expect learners to keep quiet and be ready for you. But unfortunately for me, that was not my experience. You know, mm. I thought maybe I, I am prepared. I got my lesson plan. This is what I'm going to do. And I thought maybe learners would be eager to hear what I have to say, but it was not the case. I had mm. to scream at the top of my lungs mm. to like maintain sil silence in the classroom, you know. And when finally I spoke to them, some of them were captivated to know what I have to offer. I, I have to agree with you there because when I spoke to Urudi about you, <laughs> Urudi mentions that when you are in the classroom, you are able to command attention. Where does that ability, Mpela, because you are here in the studio, you are soft-spoken, <laughs> right? There's an assumption that for you to be taken seriously, you need to have um, an extroverted personality, possibly boisterous, mm. but you are here clear mm. but quiet. <laughs> but you're able to do what many teachers in this country struggle to do, which is to command, and not to their fault also, mm. to command the attention of 72 minds. Mm. How do you do Where does that come from, do you think? Um, knowing your learners. Okay. You have to know your learners. Okay. Um, there are so many theories, especially when you are a teacher. You're told when you get into a classroom, you have to do this. You know, learners will respond to you, I think. Mm. So now you have to know. That. At first, obviously, it was a struggle. I tried so many different ways to quieten the kids. And what were those strategies? Like maybe you would just walk into class, keep quiet, and hope that they will keep quiet. Sure. Or walk into a classroom, um, remind them to take out their classwork books. Some of them will continue staring at you. Some of them will continue with their conversations because these are 72 learners in one class, mm. you know. And they know that you cannot reach the back, the back of the classroom. Because you know? there's no walking mm. way between you and the back. Mm. 
So those two strategies, amongst others, didn't serve you. What strategy did? Um, I spoke to other teachers and found that you have to really, really, really talk to them first. Introduce yourself and tell them what you are capable of. And what I've realized is people learn by relating. Mm. If people don't relate to your story... Um, they won't listen to you, maybe. They will judge you and what's not. So now, those are the kids in a very disadvantaged area, the most, the high spot, mm. um, the the hot spot, sorry, the hot spot of crime in Gauteng, mm. you know. So you just have to tell them who you are, your experiences, and what you want for them. Please, if you can, teacher Ho Ho, mm. give us <laughs> a glimpse of that introduction. I am Miss Mpela Hoho. I'm a fall teacher. I love learning. I love teaching. And I understand your background because I was once a learner like you. I ate the same food you eat during lunch. I wore probably the same uniform as you. Mm. And I had good teachers in front of me, but unfortunately, I didn't listen to them. I did pass, but I didn't listen to my teachers. So if I did listen to my teachers, I could be doing something else. I could be impacting lives in different ways. Mm. So I chose to be a teacher because I want to see you guys reaching your goals in life. Mm. So listen to me, you will get there. Yeah, yeah. And also when you look at the context of where you're from, at times, children are not seen. Mm. So to have an adult to do a, an act of humility of saying, hi, this is who I am, and this is what I want to do for you. Mm. It changes the, the dynamic, doesn't it? Mm. It does. Because when you walk in cl into a classroom and you demand attention, they're going to fight back. Yes. They're going to fight back. So you have to assure them that you care. They have to know that you care. They have to know that you are not hired to teach, but you are hired to help them reach their goals. Mm. That you, those are two different things. Those are two different things. Because if you just say, I'm a teacher, they feel attacked, you know. Like, mm. you don't understand our backgrounds. We cannot understand you because of this and that and that. But if you tell them that, you know what, I also went to a public school. Even yours is way more beautiful. Like, look at the buildings. You have lights. And also, you can mm. reference that school because they, they, some of them may even know it. Mm. They may have some reference to schools that look like the school that you come from. Mm. Sure. Now, <laughs> we are nearing the end of the year, mm. right? With your, with your learners. Tell us your journey now in molding children getting them ready with curriculum, with the f with file, and, and, and what were the most striking challenges in their learning experience? Um, the most challenging um, thing for my learners is intervention, right? English, it's a social and a skill subject. Writing is a skill. Everyone can write, but for the rightful purpose, I don't think so. You know, yeah. when you say write a letter to this person, you have to check sentence by sentence. You have to check the register. But if you just tell them the how part and not do a follow up and not check if they're doing the right thing, that's why you will get surprised, you know. Mm. So now what I do now to like prepare them, because I don't want them to pass and get like lower marks and it's a pass, you go to the next grade. These are my grade 11 learners and I want them to qualify for university because that is the purpose of going to school, to pursue your dreams. And most of them, they want to be lawyers, they want to be teachers mm, because nice. of Mrs. Ho. Come on now! <laughs> they want to be teachers and they don't really have the knowledge, you know. Mm. Now, I have introduced a program, an intervention program for the grade 11 learners. Um, it's called hashtag got me, get me to metric, wherein um, yes. learners are given two slots, like they attend twice a day. It's the normal period we have daily, and they choose whether they want to come in the morning or in the afternoon. Then that is then we take it sentence by sentence. <laughs> 
When you say the intervention is in the morning, that means it's not during the timetable slots, no. It's not. Skolo so na sikala kamang kapkat half seven. Yeah. Classy or na? Um, the intervention program we start at six thirty. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. We start at 6.30 yes. and the normal school time is 7.30. So I give them one hour before their actual like school time. And to my surprise, honestly, I thought maybe I will be having like 15 learners. How many do you get? And each morning, like in a day, like the morning session actually is the one that gets packed. Wow. I get about um, 60 learners. Out of the 72. Out of the 72. In terms of the pass rate of your grade 11s, when you started with them, the average, the class average, wh- what what were we what are we looking at there? Um, the average was let me just say um, in the first term because I joined the school. Uh, May mm. it was April. Yeah, it was. I think it was April. Mm. I joined the school in April, and I think I managed to improve the pass rate from a forty something to. Uh, 60 right oh. mm, because I'm that teacher I make sure that whatever I teach learners get to practice and they get it right you are not just doing it for the sake of doing it we are doing this because you will be writing formal letters soon you will be writing application letters soon for funding for scholarships for whatever you will be doing so this is these are real life skills that we are learning these are real life skills we are learning so I have to make sure that you get it correct because it's not everyone who's going to help you do this, you know. Urudi was even telling me how intricately you even go into describing the difference um, with Dem- hyperlinks. Mm. Things like .co.za, .org, .com, .ac. Dot... And to be honest, Dimna, I don't even think anyone taught me this. <laughs> I was just like, okay... I'm oh. seeing as I'm going, but you go the extra mm. mile to teach that. Why is that particularly important to you? Remember I said English is a skill subject. It's a social and skill subject, mm. you know. And if I do not teach them, who will? Because in the ATP, I found that they have like email, how to write an email. And most of us learn those things when we get to university. Yeah. Like what is an email? Whereas it is the in the ATP, you know. So I was teaching them about different domains, the register, you know, the CC, the BCC, and all those mm. things, all those small things. And to my surprise, they were clueless, you know, the poor kids. And I had to teach them that because next year, next year by April, they will be applying for university. Yeah, yeah. And I like I said, these are the kids from a very disadvantaged area. So if us teachers do not do the justice that we have to do who's going to help them and also on pillar the way that you teach speaks to your vision because another individual would be like i get you know i'm teaching the curriculum mm. this is what i cat if they don't have get the computers to study cat that's not necessarily a reflection on my kpis mm. but what you were saying that i'm a teacher so you can have a better chance at life a better chance looks like you being able to assert yourself by sending an email, by knowing how to narrate your story or your, your request or whatever through sending an email and being mm. independent in your storytelling, in your application forms and this, that and the next. Mm. Um, so there's a great alignment between the way that you teach what you teach and your intentions with with your learners. But having said that, what has been one of the greatest challenges of teaching um, in Oliven? Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start with the curriculum, right? Mm. First of all, our kids don't know why they are learning English. That is the first question I pose in class when I walk, when I'm given an, or assigned a class. Why are you learning English? And what are the answers usually? I don't know. It's compulsory. Whoa. And then I was like, English is a lingua franca. English can be your liberation. You can get your educa- your education and fly anywhere across the world. And what's the response? And when find you say employment. That? They were like, we were not away. We were not even thinking of leaving the country. You know, because there are universities out there. You have to aim high. Mm. 
So those are the kids with clogged minds. Mm. They don't want to leave their comfort zone because we are from a disadvantaged area. It's not possible. Mm. You know, then you have to make them understand why they are learning the subject. Then after that, you have to show them, like maybe give them realistic topics. Mm. Like write an email to the school and inquire about the course you want to or the discipline or the field that you want to find yourself in. Mm. You know? I mean, what you speak about now just speaks to the side effects of apartheid, special apartheid with, mm. with Bantu stunts and, what we, and, the, and, the, and still that legacy showing itself in how people can imagine themselves outside of their community. It's very difficult. We have nine provinces and they're still very much, you know, tribalistic, very tribal specific. So mm. South Africa... Unlike some parts of the world, it's very difficult for people to imagine themselves even outside of the immediate community, mm. let alone the province, mm. you know? Yeah, because that's the problem we have, like, in the schools in my area, because learners see themselves as people who will never make it, you know, because they're from this poor background. Yeah. Nobody cares about them. It's very difficult to, like, get to school because yeah. some of them have to leave their homes, like, um, six o'clock whereas the school starts at half past seven they have yeah. been working working for an hour yeah they are tired it's not possible you know good lasting they are overcrowded it's not easy for teachers to teach it's not easy for teachers to see that this learner struggles with sentence construction because how will you be able to check um activities for like 72 learners every day in class how will you manage to sign the books you have to teach and sign at the same time do corrections at the same time how can you do that how can you do that so it f it affects th that is one of the challenge um i have it affects proper learning and teaching yes yes you know because you cannot do the intervention you cannot check you can't even walk between the learners you cannot even maintain the silence sometimes because these are teenagers 72 of them in one class mind you so how do you build, because you said in the beginning that for you to hold the attention of your learners, you need to know your learners. How mm. do you then derive a relationship with them when it's 72 of them? Um, I give them an opportunity to speak about their experiences. Mm -hmm. For instance, if we were doing prepared speech, I could give them a topic like, tell mm. me about the parent you would like to be. Mm. then learners will narrate the kind of a parent they currently need, you know. Ooh. So now they can see that you are a safe space for them. Ooh. You allow them to bring their experiences in the classroom. You don't want them to be like working robots or those perfect kids who do not have stress, you know. So you acknowledge that, you know what, I know what you are going through now. Let's do this and then let's practice writing using our own feelings, using our own experiences. Then they start trusting you. And also now they're engaging the curriculum from a personal place. From a personal from place. From a personal place. Sheree mm -hmm. Halley speaks about that in episode three of uh, Leading Today from Tomorrow, creating a teaching and learning environment mm -hmm. where learners are invested in the curriculum um, as opposed to just narrating it for the sake of mm -hmm. just narrating it. Pilar, <laughs> the challenges that you are sharing here, for me, I wonder, how do you support yourself? In, 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 in this journey of being a teacher. So you have learners who obviously don't just bring themselves, but their whole backgrounds and context into the classroom. Mm. And you see their background and, 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 and context so viscerally, you can't avoid, you can't avoid it. You see it mm. and you respond to it. How do you renew your strength? Um, from... The learners' comments, mm. the learners' comments and their response to what I'm trying to do keeps me going. I don't want to lie. The comments and learners trusting you says to me that actually I am doing something. Unfortunately, we don't have any support, but luckily I'm a candidate fellow or a fellow because Hello. I graduated. Hello, <laughs> please. Uh, that's All about her. <laughs> You know, I have like partially completed my 
um, <sighs> uh, things, all the things that I have to do yes. bef be before I become a failure. You yes. know, I'm halfway there. And, you know, having the learners confirm that, ma'am, you are doing the right thing. Ma'am, we hear you. Ma'am, we know that you, you care. Remember, I got into this profession because I wanted to impact lives. Mm. I wanted to make sure that learners are on par with their dreams and goals. Mm -hmm. And when they confirm that, ma'am, um, last time I got level two, this term I got level five. Because what I've realized is whatever that I'm teaching them in my class, the attitude, how you approach life, you know, how you approach your teachers, they are transferring that into other languages. Mm -hmm. They sometimes ask, ma'am, can you please talk to this teacher and maybe we could find a common ground because we are having a challenge, you know, then please talk to her for us, you know. And they change bit by bit, one learner at a time. Sometimes learners will be like, ma'am, ever since I came to the school or ever since I started learning this subject, I never got this mark. It's so mm. sad because some of them don't even know that they are that good mm. or capable. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. So having them say those things or utter those words really keeps me going. And like I said, I wanted to say um, we also have like support from JGF. Yes. Um, is it um, there is this um, organization, not organization, like the psychologists that you have that you offer? I guess. The I guess the emotional support that we get from JGF. Because I think. It, it's last month I was talking to one of the psychologists, you know, because mm. it was getting a little bit too much, you yeah. know. Yeah. Teacher burnout is real. You Teacher mentioned. burnout is real. Two months into the profession and already it's everything is shaking. Yeah. But with JGF, it's a plus because you have that support. Please unpack your relationship with 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 Rudy. Rudy is one of our uh, teacher coaches. Rudy Machi with Jade Glenn, who is the regional teacher coach in the Western Cape Province. How has it been knowing that you can get, you know, the kind of support that you get from Rudy? And please just give us, you know, a glimpse of how Rudy's advice and teaching styles and methods have been useful for you? Um, experience is the best teacher and Rudy's experienced in this field. Yeah. And the subject that I'm teaching or I'm currently offering, you know. So um, he, they understand. They understand whatever that I'm going through and they listen. Mm. very well attentively and whatever solution that they come up with comes from my current um, situation and from a place of encouragement a place of development I never in a day felt um, judged mm. by Rudy or ridiculed or belittled um, they understand very well what's going on and I get to invite them to the school. They get to see firsthand of what is going on mm. and they're very supportive and we went through the chapter of Teaching Like a Coach book. You know that book that we have? Yeah, Teaching Teach Like a Champion. Teach Like a Champion. A dog, yeah. Yes. And there are some chapters there that really assist with lesson planning, lesson delivering, and classroom management. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. So, Mpila, you also speak quite, you know, quite clearly, poignantly about how you know the upsides. You, you, you explain very well. Learners responding to you. Thank mm. you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. You have the other extreme side of the coin, where you are dealing with overt aggression mm. from learners how has that experience made you feel and how is it impacting on your passion for teaching um can i just give you like a general description of what's happening in south african schools sure please um we are losing a lot of good teachers mm. because the pressure is put on teachers and not the environment and not the learners 
Mm. You know, I think at some point our policies are failing teachers because no one is protecting teachers. Mm. No one is like checking up on teachers, mm. you know, and the policies and all the rules we have now are kind of encouraging our kids not to listen to teachers because they know that teachers are not protected. So as a newly qualified teacher and the environment that I work in, I do not feel protected. I do not feel heard by the department, mm. you know, because um, there are no rules that protect teachers. If a learner is rude towards you or if a learner threatens you, you cannot do anything mm. because you're a teacher. You cannot address the behavior because you are ruining the child's future, yeah. even though they could have started it or even though they are showing signs of being aggressive towards you. Yeah. Mm. So uh, in, in dealing with the kinds of aggression from, from learners, what have you experienced is the intervention from the school that you are at currently? Mm, we do have like male teachers who are really trying to like maybe talk to the learners. Like sometimes, like last month in August, we had... Um, we have invited um, popular people like one of the 2018 Miss South Africa finalists, I think. Mm. She was invited to the school to talk to the girls. And we also had male um, teachers and guests who will talk to the male kids, you know, because that's where the aggression really comes from, mm. you know. And we are really trying to, like, get to the bottom of whatever is troubling the kids so that, the environment is both safe for other kids and or, and the teachers. Mm. You know, we are trying and the school is trying very hard to educate those learners about good behavior, morals, respecting teachers, but it, it gets tricky. Mm. It, sometimes it is as if we are not trying and it depends on the day of school. On Friday it gets worse. Learners are like all over the place and, you know, Microaggressions do happen here and there. These are learners, you know. These are learners from every um, area that is known yeah. for and, crime. And also, no. it's, it's, it's not the, the issue is not the school itself. No. The issue is that you have a population of children who are modeling the behaviors of the adults True. around them. Mm. And I think... Um, we are do preparing our teachers thoroughly, like during university studies. I was prepared. Content-wise, I was prepared. I have GGF um, preparing me to be this best teacher I can be. But the environment that we are sending teachers is not evaluated. Mm. Yes, the teacher may be the best, but is this classroom ready for the teacher? That is the question we should be asking ourselves. Mm. Mm. Because a lot of teachers are leaving the profession because there are so many cons than pros. Yes, I want to impact lives, but at the end of the day, I'm not protected. Nobody checks up on me. Mm. Since I have graduated, all I have to do is to, like, maybe probably attend um, a workshop once a term or once in two terms, and that's it. Mm. And all the administration, all the um, counseling that I have to do, because these learners are troubled, you know. Mm. Sometimes it gets a little bit too much because I'm one person. Yeah. In one class, I have 72 learners and I have four classes in total. Mm. So I'm taking care of so many different souls, but not even one person is taking care of me. Or one person is taking or is checking up on me. Because we also have the issue of parental involvement, which is close to non-existent. So the learners are, are our priority. And how do you manage that, right? Because I, as it sounds, it's as if, you know, your experience with your teacher coach is the most consistent in mm. your in your teaching uh, experience. Now, let's speak about stakeholder management. You are managing learners. Mm -hmm. You are part of a staff uh, team mm -hmm. and you have parents. What are the interventions that are around in your teaching environment where all three of these stakeholders are involved in some shape or form? Um, can I start with the parents? Sure. The parents are really not in touch. Mm. They are not there. We are not counting the parents <laughs> because 
they are not necessarily doing justice, you know. So I only have the school manager and myself, mm. you know. And the school manager is really, really trying to, like, counsel, have sessions with teachers, and sometimes they can help you that. You can actually approach this problem from this angle. Mm. So I think that is the minimum support I get. Mm, mm, mm. And with the teachers not no sorry with the parents not participating do you feel like there could be a significant change improvement in 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 pupils participation at school if parents were more involved or do you think you know what it's actually best that in this context that they not necessarily we need the teachers i mean the parents, the parents. because <clears throat> if learners can see that the teachers are, the parents are not involved like they're sending a, a negative message that maybe education is not that important. Yeah. They are not encouraging them. So you are the literally the only person who's trying, you know, and it's not easy. But I was telling them today that, you know what, some private schools are doing the very same curriculum you are doing. Yeah. But um, there is low performance in public school. There is high performance in um private school. So the issue here is attitude towards education and parental involvement. Yeah. Because this is basically the same thing we are doing, but there are different outcomes. There are different outcomes. There are different contexts. There mm. are different... Yeah, there are different contexts and everyone needs to play a role. Everyone. We need, we actually need the parents more than anything because um, sometimes you would call a parent to the school and they will get surprised. But I know my child behaves very well at home. Mm. What you are saying, ma'am, doesn't make sense to me. Mm. Mm. So we need them. They have to know that, you know what, when the kids get to school, they change yeah. drastically. Some become bullies because why? You don't know. And you think maybe this comes from home, but at home there are different people. So if teachers and parents can work together honestly, like putting more effort into the learner's work and behavior, I think things will definitely get better. Yeah, yeah. Mpela, we are so, so, so motivated and we are incredibly proud to have partnered with you on your vision, right? Mm -hmm. And in so doing, I want to ask you a question that we ask all of our guests here at JGF Amplified. Our hashtag is hashtag be a teacher. <laughs> Teacher Kho, mm -hmm. why should young people in this year South Africa choose the teaching profession? Through teaching, we can actually have the best country we all want. Mm. It is through teaching. It's through um, rectifying what we went through. If we get to rectify all those things that we wish we had or we wish could have happened, mm. we will finally get it right. Mm. I'm moved by this thing of rectifying because truly you are an honest individual in the, in the, in the fact that you went back to that community. You want to teach to rectify your mm. attitude as a child that you had towards education, mm. that you had towards your teachers. You want to go back and rectify those quote-unquote wrongs or misgivings. Mm. Um, and we need that book. <laughs> In Pursuit of a Language by Mela Definitely. Ho. Definitely. <laughs> that is a, a book I'm a buy. <laughs> That's most certainly a book in that I will... In pursuit of a language. In pursuit of a language. And it mm -hmm. is not just the English language that you are in pursuit of, right? Mm -hmm. In a language that empowers young people in the classroom to know that they are what Prof. Uh, Jonathan Janssen says, smarter than what you think. You are smarter mm -hmm. than what you think. Um, this is a book we need. Mm. Um, just to add cherry on top, do you know the language debate be between Chinua Achebe and OBJ Wali? Please expound on it. Um, they were debating that. Um, one of them was saying, 
why do you have to use the language of the oppressor? And the person said, so that people who were oppressed by the same oppressor who have a different language from mine can relate. So I'm spreading the message to the masses. Mm. And that doesn't mean I hate my language. Mm. That doesn't mean my own language is less important than this global language. Mm. But this is for the nations and not my people only. Ngugi Wationgo says that um, English is a language that you should use, but do not allow English to use you. Mm. So the fear of, of, of losing the sense of self is a thing that looms, uh, I think, for a lot of black people in our country due mm. to the side effects, due to the effects and the side effects of apartheid and how much we have lost as a people where identity is concerned. Mm. Um, it also speaks to the kinds of attitudes that people have towards Afrikaans, mm. that there is no way I'm going to interact with anything that quote unquote doesn't look like me because we have lost, lost so much. Mm. And your proposal here, Mpela, is, well, use this language as a key towards citizenship. Mm, for mm, you to be able mm. to be a citizen in this country, but in a grander scheme, being a global citizen, mm. because our imagination as a country due to spatial apartheid has been locked mm. to a particular geography. You sure. are either in this province, in that province, and the people of your people speak in a particular way, mm. and you can't escape the way that they think. And, mm. and, 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 and instead of bringing who you are, and your people into the national conversation mm. and to the continental conversation mm. and then to the global conversation. Mm. Your intervention, in my terms, is wild. Okay? <laughs> it's wildfire <laughs> and it is a thing that we need. Um, mm. And we are so incredibly proud to have your caliber. Have you choose us, Metuna? <laughs> Who are we? We are just five years old in this game. And we mm. have a teacher who te um, um, choosing us. And we are you are so incredibly pleased with all the work that you do. We've got you. Um, and thank you so much for your time and gracing us with your presence on JGF Amplified. Thank you very much for having me. Sure thing. <laughs> Betuna, the authority in the room, baby. I'm telling you that. Betuna, check us. Continue the conversation on social media. You will find us on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Facebook. We will see you now next episode as we round off the year 2022. We started this podcast in February and here we are. We could not be prouder of our journey. And we thank you so much for being faithful listeners. Share our podcast far and wide. And remember, hashtag Betuna, be a teacher.